Oh, well, for me, I think it's just going to be you and me from now on because I don't think people are going to mm. join or this go hard. It's going to be just, just, just us. I mean, I'm in it if you are in it too. Because each day it feels like it's, it's just you and me here, right? People are not for some reason. Maybe they're too busy with their things, right? With their projects and their classes and things. But um, I don't know. I'm, I plan on finishing this book and leading this cohort all the way up to the end, even if it's just me. But, um, but yeah, we'll see. All right, so let's begin. Um, okay, so this is chapter five. So chapter five, we're moving to the final part of the of what the authors call the introduction or the introductory concepts for Bayesian uh, statistics or Bayesian analysis. So in this chapter, we're going to go through one example specifically. Um, when we on how to understand and how to deal with something that's called conjugate families, which is um, something that sounds, I feel like, too complicated for what really is. And it's very, very helpful sometimes, but it's not the end all or the only way to work um, with Bayesian models. It's just a very useful tool that if we can implement it, then let's go ahead. So let's understand what this means. So the learning objectives for this chapter are basically two. The first one is to practice building Bayesian models. And that means recognizing what kernels are and the use of proportionality. And two, familiarize yourself with conjugacy, specifically what makes a prior a conjugate. And this is going to be like um, understanding uh, what this conjugate means, right? It's the combination of two things, but what exactly does that mean? We're going to be working with the following Greek letters, which are lambda, mu, sigma, tau, and theta in English, but in, in other languages, they may be um, they may pro be pronounced differently. And like I said, this is our last chapter on Bayesian foundations, right? And the basic concepts to move to other um, more advanced analysis. So let's go to the other slide. So if we if we remember what a, how to choose a prior or the concepts that we need to understand in order to choose a prior, we can remember that priors need to be flexible, that when choosing a prior, something that we need to always keep in mind is how much computer power we have, because if we have uh, access to a supercomputer, then we can have a complicated model with a very complicated prior and very complicated model because the posterior is gonna be built very easily, right? But if we have, um, as we decrease the computational power that we have, then the more complicated this is gonna be. I know of people, for example, that have uh, created models and that they are running models for almost a month and they have good computers. So this is just something that um, comes with the territory, right? The computational power that is required. And the other thing is how inter interpretable are the results? So if we remember a little bit um, of the beta binomial model that we've been working on in the past few chapters, we can remember that we were working with um, proportions. And these proportions, because they were constrained between zero and one, usually followed, um, we could um, describe them by using a beta distribution. So the prior would, all, would often be, um, or we would often use the beta distribution to explain that um, parameter or to describe that parameter. And in the case of the beta distribution, yes, Olawafemi, you have a question? If you yes, put it in. Uh, yeah. Yes. I want to ask, like uh, you were talking about, uh, we have a complicated model in which we can run it for over a month. Yeah. So I uh, would like, we want to ask in that case, 
can we also automate the process by maybe we say using GitHub action to to run the model in that case will it going to, is it going to work in that case so i don't know much about github um that that's it that you just mentioned about github i don't i mean i use github very um like no, i mean github action github action github actions yeah i don't yes. know anything about that i only use github to sort of have a well to host my website and to have like a repository of some of my um scripts and stuff like that and projects what i do know is that you can use many universities in the us at least they have um something called a supercomputer so you can have access to that if you or one of your co-authors in a project um, and many times it's free because if you're a student and role student or you're working for that university, then you have access to that supercomputer and then you send it there. And in a matter of hours, the model is, is ready. Another thing that I do know is that some people just let their computers run the model. It doesn't mean that you, you cannot access your computer or you cannot keep working on other things. It's just that you have to have that script open and it has to be working, right? Using some of the RAM of your computer and using some of the other things. Um, or other people have um, laptops dedicated for that and then they use their work computer for other things or something like that. So there are many ways of doing this. It, it would depend on how to, how complicated your model is. For me, at the beginning of the year, like around April or March, I was running a model that was so complicated that I've been running it for two weeks and the thing was still running. It was insane. It took me like close to, yeah, I think 17 days to finish running. And I do know I have a friend who ran a model for a month. You just leave your computers running. So, so but there are ways of bypassing that. If you're interested in those GitHub actions, because I don't I don't know anything about that, then maybe you can ask it on the Slack channel because I don't I, I really don't know what GitHub actions are or Git actions. I, I don't know. Sorry about that. Just talking based on my experience. Um, but I think someone on Slack probably has more information or has more insight into this question that you have. So if we continue here, we know that the um, that the beta binomial model then has that prior. Usually, we're working with um, the beta distribution, and then the data model. Uh, we're going to have uh, data that, in the case of the beta binomial model, is going to follow a binomial distribution in the sense that we have a number of uh, successes that we're trying to measure and the proportion of those successes occurring in the data. And then the posterior was follow that beta distribution because that's the conjugation or the conjugate of the beta binomial. When you have a beta prior and a, a binomial data model, then the posterior follows a beta distribution. And you can see here the, um, the data model when we see y and n inside the beta, uh, inside the posterior, sorry, then that's the influence of the, of the data model. The larger the data that we have and the more data points that we have, that's going to affect a lot or influence a lot that posterior. And the same can be said about the prior. If the data that we have is just like 20 data points and we really don't have a lot of data collected, then the prior is going to influence the beta and alpha uh, parameters from the beta distribution in the prior are going to influence a lot of posterior. Anyway, I'm just repeating what we've seen in previous, um, in previous chapters, but this is like the, um, the, 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 when we're working with a beta prior and a model that follows a binomial distribution, then that's how we, create that posterior. That's the conjugate of the beta binomial model, right? That's the, the posterior. So that's basically when we're working with um, 
with conjugates, this is the, the way that we see it mathematically. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit more. Um, so the conjugate prior is basically just saying that um, if the resulting posterior model with um, probability distribution function that looks like this, is going to be this is, so let me repeat that again. If the resulting posterior model with a um, probability density function is of the same model family as the prior, then we say that it is a conjugate prior. So like we said, we like we saw here, if the resulting posterior, this one, is of the same model family as the prior, this one, then we say this is a conjugate prior. So we're saying that the posterior, if it has the same distribution or the same PDF, the probability density function as a prior, then that means that they're going to be conjugates. And in this case, that's that's exactly what, what we are, what we're seeing, right? With the beta binomial. And that, because we have this um, sort of agreement, right? We, want, we, we know that this is how things work or um, that these models can work, then we, it's easier to work because then we know exactly how our posterior is gonna look if we have uh, based on our prior, right? So we, this is what the authors say, right? Like the conjugate priors or working with conjugate priors spark joy because it's so easy to work with them. So now we go into the example that we're, um, or the another conjugate family, which is the gamma Poisson conjugate family. And the example that we're going to be working with is estimating the number of fraud risk phone calls. So this is a very pervasive situation happening in the US. I don't know if it happens in other countries. In my country, it's not. There are a lot of um, fraud calls happening, but it's not as pervasive as here in the US. I must get like 10 calls a day that are fraud, that, that they are asking for information just to steal my information, right? Anyway, it's crazy. So, um, so if we are going to estimate the number of fraud risk phone calls that a person gets per day, then this is the model that we can uh, that we can use or we can follow, right? So that's the that's the example. So let's start with the prior. So the prior is based on what information we have prior to starting to think about this, to start to collect the data. How do we start thinking about what prior to use? So if we know that we want to estimate that rate, the number of fraud risk phone calls per day, because we have to establish a time frame here or a space frame here, right? If it's gonna be the number of, of phone calls, in this case, time per day, but it could also be like the number of, um, I work with animals, so for me it would be like the number of animals per square kilometers, right? Or it could be, the number of people that are living or the number of people that are that have a salary larger than $100,000 a year in urban centers or per square kilometer or something like that, right? We have to establish a time frame or a space frame for this rate to work. So let's start thinking about the prior, right? What information do I have prior to starting this? So I'm saying, or the example, not me, right? But the example is saying that they think that the rate of phone calls per day that a person is getting is close to five, but that can range from two to seven. The other thing that we know about the prior is that we only can have positive values and they have to be integers because we're not working with I can get minus 4.5 calls per day, right? We cannot have negatives and we cannot have decimal values. They can only be integers. So then that's for the prior. And then we go to collect the data. When we're starting to think about the model and the way that we're gonna collect the data, we start thinking that um, the data that we collect is going to be a count, 
meaning that we can only have positive integers because it's going to be how many calls per day we can get. And the data is not limited by number of trials like we saw with binomial distributions or binomial experiments because we can get up to a thousand calls per day, right? We can get zero calls per day or we can get so many, right? Like a thousand. So then when we see this, that we're working with integers with positive values, then we notice that we are dealing with the gamma Poisson conjugate family because the prior looks like this, um, this rate resembles very much like a gamma distribution. And if I share, let me see here. Oh, I actually, I must have it open. Let's see. I put something in, um, here it is, in the Slack channel. And that, I think, there you, I think it can be seen here in the screen. So if we see there's a table of conjugate distributions that already exist, this book has it. This is freely available for everyone. I just took it from this book, but we can see that uh, we just have to understand what the uh, distribution we are using to explain the likelihood, to explain the prior. And then uh, we have here the posterior distribution. These are the conjugate distributions that exist. The most famous or the most used ones at least because apparently there are many many more so we've been working with the beta binomial distribution and today we're going to use this one the gamma the Poisson the gamma Poisson or the Poisson gamma distribution and uh we see like we were, we were saying at the beginning right if the prior follows if the posterior has the same distribution as the prior then we know that we are working with conjugate distributions or we can be working with conjugate distributions. Okay, so let's try to understand the Poisson data model and the gamma uh, model. So for the Poisson data model, we know that this is gonna be for when we are collecting our data, why it's going to represent the number of independent events that occur in a fixed amount of time, or like I said, it has to be in a uh, time or space, a limited time or space. In this case, we're working with time. And that can be um, mathematically notated as Y conditional on the data that we collected follows a person distribution, which only has one parameter, which is going to be lambda. And that lambda represents this exactly the uh, the rate or the um, the estimated uh, the expected value of number of calls per day. That's what in this case that's what the lambda represents. This is the probability mass function for the Poisson. And let's remember that we're working with count data or we're working with um, not continuous data, right? But we're working with discrete model with, with, with discrete data. This is a probability mass function uh, for, um, for lambda and for the Poisson distribution. And let's remember that this has to sum to one. So when we have it, um, and this is the expected value on the variance or the mean and the variance, the Poisson distribution has a very interesting property where the expected value and the variance are exactly the same as the parameter that they are uh, of the parameter of the function, right? Of the distribution. And that is super handy because all you have to remember literally is that lambda. I love Poisson because of that. Anyway, moving on. Um, this is how the Poisson distribution looks like with different uh, lambda, when lambda takes different values. So when lambda is equal to one, then we're gonna have a more skewed distribution to the right. And that means that the expected number of phone calls that, that has like the, the, the more likely 
that you're going to get the higher probability is going to be for, for that one, for that lambda equals to one. So we are really expecting the probability of that being the, the highest, right? That's the that's the mean. So that can be understood as that. So the expected number of calls per day that we can expect when having this model or for this model is going to be one. And then we are decreasing the probability of having an increased number of calls. Like, so for example, receiving 10 fraud calls per day is going to be less likely than receiving one. But receiving four phone calls, phone fraud calls a day is going to be more likely than receiving 10. That's what this distribution is saying. When, as we start to increase lambda or we increase that parameter, then the distribution starts looking more like the normal distribution. But this is for count data, right? So it starts to become more um, symmetrical. And then when you have very, very large numbers, then it's going to be a skewed to the left, skewed to the left. So that's just something to understand about the Poisson distribution. But um, when we're talking about the joint probability mass function, we have that this is going to be the equation that we have here. This is going to be the probability mass function for each day. But if we want for any day, not just for one day or per day, but for any day, we need to join you, we need to use the joint probability mass function, which is going to be the product of every probability mass function possible. So that's why we're 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 creating this mass function instead of just working with one of them. Um, so this is going to be for the data model. We're going to use the Poisson distribution to describe the data that we're collecting. We already saw that we're going to use the gamma distribution to understand the prior or to describe the prior, which is going to be the number of phone calls per day. And now, which is, oh, I'm so sorry, that's that's coming now. I thought I've mentioned that before. So um, we have three probability models that we can use, which are gamma, Weibull, and um, the F distribution. But I already mentioned it. We're going to use the gamma one because this thing with the um, with the conjugate distributions, we're, we know that we're using Poisson for the likelihood or for the data. And then we know that if we use a, a gamma prior distribution or a gamma distribution for the prior, we know how the posterior is going to look like. So it's very easy to work like that, right? Let's say we were working with um, binomial data, then we can use the beta distribution for the prior and, and that we know how the posterior is gonna look like, right? The same thing if we were using the normal uh, distribution for the likelihood or for our data, we know that we can use usually the normal, but there are other ones like the inverse gamma that we could use, but usually is normal, normal, because the normal distribution is so simple. Well, not simple, but it's very, mm, yeah, you can estimate easily the mean and the uh, standard deviation or the variance in order to understand and to describe that distribution. So for the posterior, that comes in very, very handy. So in this case, because we're working with Poisson, then let's use the gamma for our prior. So the um, so if we start with um, with the parameter, let's start to understand this gamma distribution that we're going to be using for the prior. So the gamma distribution, which is the one we're going to use to explain the um, to explain lambda has two parameters. This is for the prior, right? We already saw um, Poisson for the likelihood or for the data that we're going to collect. So now let's understand uh, the prior. So we need two hyperparameters 
to understand the gamma distribution or to describe the gamma distribution, which are going to be S and R. They can also take other letters. I, I am trying to remember how I've seen it. Oh, let's see how this author, uh, oh yeah, he calls them alpha and beta. So as long as we have two letters inside the, or at least if we know that the gamma distribution is gonna have two parameters, we can call them whatever we want. It really doesn't matter, but I've seen it like alpha and beta and I've seen it in a different way too in other books. I don't remember exactly what. Um, and these, the authors of this book, they call them SNR. So, um, so um, then if we go to the probability density function, which is gonna give us exactly how that looks like, right? Like the shape of the graph of the distribution, sorry, seen in a graph, then that's exactly what we're gonna get. This is the equation and it's important to note that every uh, value of lambda has to be larger than zero. So we're only working with integers and positive integ integers. Okay, so that's gonna <coughs> give us a density function, the y-axis. And then we know um, the, for the for the graph, right? So the central tendency is gonna be the expected value or the mean is gonna be the two parameters, the two hyperparameters of the gamma distribution divided into each other. The mode is gonna be S minus one divided by R only for values, the values that S can get or that they, that, yeah, the values that S can take are larger than one or one. And the variance is going to be S divided by R squared. And that's important because then we can use that to describe or to, um, yeah, to describe the posterior. So when S is equal to one, the exponential model equals gamma S equal one and R, um, and then we can define R. So this is a special case when S is one when s takes that value of one then what we're saying here is that the exponential model is exactly the same as the gamma model when s has one value right so this is important to note um when we start seeing them graphically and i think that's what comes here right yeah so that's what we have here um so the gamma distribution let me just zoom in here for a little so that it's more clear. Okay. So the authors want us to sort of test, they want us to sort of, um, yeah, test our knowledge or try to gauge how much we're understanding the gamma distribution. So let's try to see or to understand how this distribution works. So when we have these gamma, and we have that the S is one and R is one. So both hyperparameters have the same value. This is the shape that it's gonna get. It's gonna have a lot of skewness towards the right. And it's going to have a lot of variability, right? Then we know that this is gonna be the mean. The mean is gonna be closer to one or it's gonna be exactly one. And the mode is going to be zero. So that is when gamma equals one and when S equals one and R equals one. Then as we increase gamma, which is what's happening here, but we leave R constant as one. So as we increase gamma, we can see that the, 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 it's, the skewness to the right is decreasing. So we see that the, um, the mean is increasing as we increase gamma. So for values, when S takes higher values than one, or as S begins to increase larger than um, R, then we know that the mean is increasing as well. Then when we what we see here in the bottom part is that we are increasing R 
and gamma, right? So we have, we started with R of one. Now we have R of two, but gamma keeps increasing from one to two to four, exactly like here, but we have an increased value of R. So how does that look like? So again, as we keep increasing R, uh, as we keep increasing S, which is the first hyperparameter, the mean starts to increase as well, but the variance, the variability is less than when the difference between S and R is greater. So bottom line of all of this that I, of all of this explanation that I said is, when the mean of lambda is larger than one, Let me just say it with between S and R. So when S is larger than R, because that's what we have here, right? S and R. When S is larger than R, which is going to be this case right here with gamma and this other case right here with gamma equals four and R equals two. So when S is larger than R, then we know that the mean is gonna be larger than one. One is right here, oops. This little line right here, this white line right here, that's when um, lambda equals one. So if S is larger than R, then we're gonna have a, a um, mean value larger than one. If, we're, if we have the contrary, or if we have the opposite, when S is less than R, which is exactly what we have here. For example, S is one, but R is two, then the mean is less than one. And the other thing that we see is with the variability. So when we have that S is much larger than R, variability is going to increase. So we're gonna see like the tails are very heavy and the skew that we see, for example, here, is not gonna be as, as pronounced. So we are gonna have less skewness. But when we have R values larger than S, like what we see here, R2 is larger than S1, then um, we have very heavy tails to the right or to the left, depending on which side we're seeing. And, um, and the mean is gonna be less than one. So that's more or less how the gamma distribution functions. Okay, so then let's continue with our uh, with our example. So we now understand a little bit about how the gamma distribution works. And we know a little bit about how the beta distribution, not the Poisson distribution works, sorry. So let's continue with our, with our, um, with our example of fraud calls. So we know that based on the prior information that we were describing at the beginning, we were saying that we think that in average, a person can, or a person is receiving around five calls per day. So then in order for this equation, so we're working with the prior, right? So in order for, this equation, because this is from the gamma uh, from the gamma distribution. So in order for this thing to work, we need to, we're saying that the expected value is close to five. Then for that to happen, if we um, solve for that equation, then we have that S equals five R. So whatever number we have for R, S is going to be five times larger. That's basically what we're saying. So if we put this into the book, into the book, into the um, into R by using this um, plot gamma function that's part of the base rules book, and we say that, for example, if the shape is going to be shape, which is the S, that's why they're using S for that parameter because it's called the shape. If the shape is going to be ten, then we know that the rate is the rate has to be five times less than that, so the rate is going to be two five times two is 10, right? So then this is more or less how our prior is going to look like. 
And I like this example because it's explaining to us or it's sort of guiding us into knowing how to understand what values to use in a prior, how to select the hyperparameter values in a prior so that we don't use an uninformative prior as we were seeing in the in previous chapters, right? Just like the gamma one one I think we were using, right? That's an uninformative parameter because it's just like a flat line. No, here we're saying we're making an informed decision and we're using an informed prior. We're putting values in here that we think um, sort of are going to resemble the data, right? Like what we are expecting the data to look like. So I, I like I like this example because of that a lot. So anyway, so now we have a prior and now we have uh, how the data is gonna look like because it's gonna follow a Poisson distribution. So we have gamma Poisson conjugacy. We know that the distribution, the posterior story is going to resemble this prior because that's basically what that is, right? Like that's the conjugacy, right? The posterior is going to resemble the prior. So then we use that gamma prior for the ray parameter and the Poisson model for the data. And that's what we have here. If we start to solve and if we start to put values into this um, into this equation in order to solve it and sort of understand how our posterior is going to look like, then this is what we are working with. So we have gamma with a hyperparameter of S of 10 and R of 2. And if we have these values for the data, we're saying that one person got six phone calls six fraud calls that day, another one got two, another one got two, and another one got one. And we have four, um, four people that we interviewed, right? That, that's our sample size. Then if we put that into here, into this model, and then we solve it, we are sort of seeing more or less how we're integrating all of these values, but then we're sort of seeing how um, the posterior is going to end up looking, right? Because we have the prior here, oops, the prior here, we have the likelihood here, and now this is what the posterior is gonna look like, right? And then, so let's see. So yeah, so this is what we have here. So we have the prior in yellow, the likelihood in blue and the posterior in green as per usual. So the prior is saying that on average we're receiving or a person is receiving, let's say 4.5 calls per day. The data said that we are receiving more or less 2.5, which is exactly what we have here. We're solving for that. Um, for that, because that's exactly what we have here, exactly with this Y. We're solving for um for the data that we collected. We're trying to understand how many, what the rate of calls would be if we had these values. So then more or less, that's what it looks like. That's the likelihood here, 2.75. So then the posterior has to be in the middle of those two things, in the of the prior and the likelihood, right? It's sort of like, if it's not in the middle and the others in the book put it, let's say this is our prior and a likelihood is this blue one. And then we have a posterior all the way over here. Then that means we made an error, something went wrong because it has to be sort of between these two things. Anyway, so the posterior is saying that on average, a person is going to get more or less, what is that, like three maybe, three calls per day? If let's say this is the number of calls per day each person receives, if that's what we have on, X, on the x-axis, then that's what the posterior is saying. Okay, so the person that did this before, and I left it because this little cat is so cute. So they they didn't, um, and I didn't want to include it because, 
or I didn't want to add any more um, slides for this because what they are trying to say here, let me put it here. What the book says is that the normal, they're just going through what the normal norm, normal conjugate family would look like. They're going, um, another example so that we know how to work with quantitative data, not quantitative, continuous data, forgive me, because we saw that the previous one with the Poisson, the gamma Poisson uh, conjugate model that was working with discrete data. So now we are going through, um, so the normal normal would be with a continuous uh, data. And it's, I, I, I thought I wasn't gonna have enough time to do it and it's already 3.45, for me 3.45. So we are 45 minutes into the hour. So I figured, I don't know, if, if we really had to go through this whole explanation, maybe we wouldn't, wouldn't have time. The bottom line of this is that if we're working with normal data, let's go through the example that they are describing here is, wait, the normal, normal, where is it? Okay, um, this is a data story that they are saying or the example, right? So scientists keep learning more and more about brain health and the dangers of concussions, hence of activities in which participants sustain repeated concussions, like in um, football, right? Or wrestling or something like that. And there's even a movie about this. What is it called? I don't remember, but um, Will Smith is in it, right? Um, such a good movie. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. So the point is that with this, dangers of concussions and this syndrome that comes from repeated concussions and brain damage, essentially, um, then we're gonna use that to understand this example. So among all people who have a history of concussions, we're interested in pi, pi, in mu, sorry, <laughs> in mu, which is the average volume of a specific part of the brain called the hippocampus. We don't have prior information about this group in particular, but Wikipedia tells us that among the general population of human adults, both halves of the hippocampus have a brain of, in the brain is between six and seven. Oh, sorry, have a volume between three and three point five cubic centimeters. So the total hippocampal volume of both sides of the brain is between six and seven uh, cubic centimeters. Using this as a starting point, we'll assume that the mean hippocampal volume among people with a history of concussions is also somewhere between six and seven centimeters with an average of 6.5. We'll balance this prior understanding with data on the hippocampal volumes of 25 subjects using the normal normal Bayesian model. So basically they're trying to compare to see if people who have have these repeated concussions if they have a larger hippocampus or a smaller hippocampus. And then they go through, we all, I think we know how the normal distribution works. We have two parameters, the mean and the variance or the, stand, or the standard deviation, and which is the spread, right, of the data. And then we can use that to understand the likelihood, which is gonna be the data that we are collecting, the data that we collect uh, on the uh, volume of the hippocampus, conditional on the mean of that um, unknown mean that we don't know anything about, right? But that's gonna follow a normal distribution with two hyperparameters, which are gonna be the, mean, the mu and the uh, um, sigma squared sigma or the variance. And then for, because it's a normal, normal conjugate family, or because we know that if we are working with a normal distributed data with, or with data that follows a normal distribution, we can use the normal uh, distribution to describe the prior for the mean. And then in this case, the mean of the uh, 
volume of the hippocampus follows a normal distribution with two parameters, which are going to be theta for the mean of that mean and tau squared tau for the variance of that mean. And then we solve for that, and that's going to be more or less uh, our prior. And because we know, or we are as saying the claim that in on average, we have 6.5, um, the volume on average that we're expecting is 6.5, basically between five uh, between six and seven square centimeters, then we use that as a mean in the prior and 0.4 um, centimeters, 0.4 square centimeters for the variance. And that gives us a normal, normal conjugacy, which is going to um, lead us to having a posterior that also follows a normal distribution. And that is going to look like Let me see, where is that? Yeah, so this is, where is the prior? Mm, I think they start with the prior later, but basically what they're saying is that um, if we put the values of that we know for the likelihood to, cons to to build, to describe the likelihood, we're working with 25 people and we measured the hippocampus to, the volume of the hippocampus to these 25 people. This is the likelihood, right? We're working with data that we collected. On average, they had a, a mean of 5.7 and a variance of 0.5 squared or a standard deviation of 0.5. Then we put that into the um, into the data model in order to plot the likelihood. And that's what we have here. The mean is gonna be at 5.75 and it's gonna be symmetrical because it's a normal distribution. And then we know based on what I explained before that the prior model had a mean of 6.5 and a standard deviation of 0.4, which is based on the what we thought about uh, prior to starting this. Uh, and then when we combine them and we and we build a posterior model, which is exactly what we see here, then we know that after solving all of this equation, we know that the posterior is going to look like this. We're going to end up with a mean of 5.8 and a very small variance. And that looks sort of like this. So in this case, the likelihood resembles a lot the, pos the posterior and the prior, not so much. <laughs> the prior was very, I mean, always giving some information, but it was, the posterior is resembling more the likelihood, I suppose, than the posterior, than the prior. And then they move further to explain why they didn't simulate data in this chapter, because data simulation is very important in order to understand these models and models in general, right? Even if we're not working with Bayesian statistics, but with um, frequentist analysis, then we say that simulation is really important. The thing here is that simulation for these conjugate distributions is very um, complicated in a way. And they further say it, let me just, highlighted here. In both of these scenarios, it's very likely that no simulated sets will perfectly match our observed sample data. So in this case, it's not, it wouldn't have been that useful to understand these models by using uh, simulations. But I think that's a very rare case. I, I am a strong advocate for simulations too. 
Another thing that, um, and I think they do have it here, is that the conjugate family or working with conjugate families is less flexible when selecting a prior and some conjugate families do not allow flat priors or uninformative priors, which in some cases could be a good idea to have because we basically don't know anything about what we're working with uh, prior to, to, um, to our analysis. So we need to use an uninformative parameter sometimes. And when we are working with conjugate families, that is not, uh, that's not um, allowed sometimes, right? Because the conjugate family is going to force you to use a specific distribution with a specific shape. So um, then to end or to summarize this chapter, let's say that conjugate priors are easy to compute on the right. They're very interpretable. For example, the beta binomial, uh, for the beta binomial, the data uh, simplified with Y is the number of successes in a set of N trials. That's super easy. For gamma, uh, for the gamma Poisson um, conjugate family, we know that Y is a count with no upper limit. So that's also very easy to understand or interpret. And for normal, normal, we're working with continuous data. So the, they're very, like what I put here. So they're very, um, they come in handy sometimes. That's, I guess that's what I'm trying to say here. So, um, yeah, but that depends on what we're working with. And um, and then I don't know why this wasn't, but I'm gonna delete that one. And then the videos for cohort one, cohort two, and then ours is gonna be here. And then that's it, you guys, or well, all of Femi because there are no other person here. And um, we only have three more chat, three more minutes for this. Um, in order, I mean. In, in three minutes, it's four for me. I don't know what time it is for you all over for me, but we have to end at four for me. Then, um, but I wanted to start sort of thinking about maybe going a little faster for the rest of the chapters and go a little faster for the chapter. And then let's maybe use the final 15 minutes or something to go through these exercises because I feel like, um, there's a lot of very good things here that I, I don't know how to solve, but if I start thinking, maybe I will come up with an idea or, or something. So I think I'm gonna start doing that for the following chapters, but for now, this chapter was very large, the fifth chapter. Um, I think the sixth one, I think, let me just check. I think, where is my, I think someone, I don't remember exactly who signed up for it. Yeah, so Diana, Diana is going to read the sixth one. And then the MCNC, if nobody else signs up, then I'll, I'll, I'll do it, uh, I'll do the seventh one, which is gonna be the MCNC. And then that's it. Do you have a question, Oluwafemi? I wasn't really paying attention to the chat, sorry. If you had any questions or, or comments. No, I do not have any question, but I want to really thank you for, for presenting the chapter. I think I'll still have to go back to the video, watch the video, and also the book again to really get a, a better to understanding of the chapter. Thank you very much. If there's anything that you didn't understand, because sometimes I feel like I over explain things or maybe I go through something too fast because I feel like others can understand it, but you can always ask me or say like, for example, with the normal distribution, I, 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 I assume everybody knows it, but maybe you don't or something like that. Oh, when, when that's the case, yeah, ask me or interrupt me and just say, Gabby, I don't understand that. Or can you explain that again or something like that? And then I can sort of go back or retrace my steps. Yes, okay, no problem.
Yeah, because it's um, this is not easy. I've been studying it all year, and I still don't get it. I mean, Bayesian analysis are or Bayesian models are so tricky. This is not easy. Trust me, and I I I don't know everything. So yeah, always always ask me if, if maybe maybe if I don't don't if I don't know it, then someone else in the Slack might know. So yeah. All right, let's finish here. Um, good night. I think it's very late for you. So good night, Oloa Femi. See you. Yes, yes. Right. Good okay, good night. See you good next night. week. See you next week. <laughs>